All right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Fabian, uh, for those of you who don't know me. And uh, I work at Wellfront, which is a startup in, in uh, the Bay Area uh, near San Francisco. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today, so don't worry. It's, it's boring. It's about finance. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about uh, what I call modern Android. Uh, so who remembers this? Good, good. See, there was a, quite a few people uh, at the very beginning. So for those, those of you who don't know, this is the very first emulator um, that was uh, introduced by uh, Google, or one of the very first um, back uh, in the days. And um, since then, of course, uh, Android development evolved quite a bit. Um, so we cannot do Android development now the same way that we used to um, when the simulator was the, the standard. So I, this, this guy over there uh, put a slide up in, <laughs> in his keynote yesterday, uh, if you watched it. And it's kind of the elephant in the room. Like, OK, all right, we need to evolve. We need to go to something different. Uh, we can now just do the same old ways. But the new way was supposed to be this. I cannot say the word. It's just, I can't. Uh, <laughs> so so what, what to do, right? Like, we need something different. So let's talk first about why, and in particular, let's, let's talk about this Android lifecycle. Uh, the Android lifecycle, you all know it, right? Uh, you learn that at the very beginning when you do Android development. And if you go in the other room, there is even like a, a nice little plastic sheet that, you know, that let you know all those events and stuff. And you're supposed to know them, and you're supposed to know what's going on. And when you first learn Android, this is what they tell you. Right? Well, first, my activity is created, then it's started, then it's resumed, then it's paused, then it's stopped, and then finally destroyed. Easy, right? Like, look at this beautiful uh, state machine, right? It's, it's amazing. It's great. So you learn that, and you're, you're quite, you feel quite good about yourself. You're like, you know, Android, this Android thing, I'm, I'm, I'm getting it. It's not that hard, right? But there is a problem. We all know that this is a lie. <laughs> they are lying to us on the documentation. It's, it's horrible. So instead, it looks a little bit more like this. Right? So you, you have, you know, it's basically the same one, but with, with a few gotchas. So you're like, OK, you're, you're making your journey as an Android developer, and you're like, OK, well, I get it. It's just, you know, there is some few things that I need to know. Right? It's just, just some, those little things here and there, I just need to learn them, and I'm going to be good to go. But there is another problem. This is still a lie. No, instead, it looks much more like this, because there was omitted methods, so it was already simplified. And frankly, it was, it was pretty complex already, right? But this is actually the full activity lifecycle, finally. And uh, as you can see, it's so big that you cannot even read it on this gigantic screen. But wait a second. I was only talking about activities. Here is the complete life cycle when you use activities and fragment the recommended way. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, at this point, well, I, mean, I don't know what to say. I think I, I just need to show that slide. Right? So nobody wants to understand that, and nobody can really truly uh, know all the different edge cases. It's just too much to ask, and especially to new developers. On one hand, it's good for us and makes us way more valuable on the job market. <laughs> but on the other end, come on, uh, this is a bit ridiculous. It's so ridiculous, in fact, that I took that from a GitHub project. People, amazing people, by the way, I don't, I don't know them, but started to open source this and started to accept pull requests when they made mistakes. And they, they implemented some code to log all of that to know what is actually going on. And it needs to be versioned, because it changes. Of course, with something as complex as that, you know, there is bugs, there is behavior that changes over the course of the versions of Android. They do a very, very good job at, at being backward compatible, but still. Um, so when I started <laughs> my new project at, at uh, the company I work for now, uh, I decided that I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. There, there has to be a better way. And in fact, wouldn't that be amazing if we went back to the promise? went back to this, something at least a little bit closer to this, right? 
Mm. Now, if that was the only problem, if there was just this nightmare of a life cycle, I might have, I might have said, OK, I'm going to use it the simpler way, and I'm going to use fragments. But that's not the only problem, unfortunately. And as you know, more money, more problems. <laughs> so what, is the problem, what are the, the problems with the activities in the fragments? So the complex life cycle we talked about. Passing object requires serialization. And it's great. I mean, there is a reason behind all of this that they didn't come up with that at random. They wanted to address the generic case, right? Where you go from one screen to another, and because your memory is limited, the screen might be killed, so everything needs to be serialized. That way it can be restored. OK, but that's, that's really cumbersome. Do activities destroy on rotation? Again, makes sense. You know, it's a complete configuration change. So you know, they, they did that for a reason. But come on, every single time I rotate my screen, I need to deserialize all of my objects? <coughs> that's a bit ridiculous. And on top of it all, the one job that this is supposed to do for us because this is all the thing it doesn't do well. But the thing it do for us is controlling the back stack, right? That when you press back, automatically it goes back to the previous screen. But you don't even have the control over the back stack of your own app. If you want to switch to a random screen in the middle, it's complicated. If you want to clean a bunch of screens that, are, that were temporary uh, from the back stack, it's, it's very hard. You, with fragments, you have to use a wrapper fragments or something. I don't even know. Um, and on top of it all, it's very hard to test. On the framework, uh, makes it extremely complicated uh, to test all of your uh, code. And we want to test our code, obviously. So let's look at the, the solution to all of those. Well, first of all, single activity architecture, right? So I said that modern Android um, comes from the fact that there was years of development, right? We, we come, we've come a long way. And one of the architecture that the community is starting to converge with uh, is the single activity architecture. And this architecture, I'm going to explain a little bit later, but it makes a lot of things very easy. Second, uh, I'm going to talk through, through my talk about views and screens. Uh, and screens, you can see them as a controller, a presenter. You can see them as whatever you want. It's just a component that uh, implements the logic of your app. And those screens, I want them to be simple Java objects. There's a constructor, you know, just, just a regular, the regular way. Because we all know Java, and why not? Why, why should it be more complex than that? Second, the screens must survive rotation. The views can't, of course. The views need to be redrawn, different uh, orientation, and all of that. So the <laughs> screens. Uh, the scrims themselves, if they don't, if they only implement logic, they can survive rotation, and they should, because that makes our life way easier. And unfortunately, in order to, for all of this to work, we're going to have to implement our own navigation system. But then, once we uh, are done with all of that, we are going to be able to separate the logic from the views and have very clean code, whilst while staying super simple in the implementation. And that means that I'm going to be a bit opinionated. So it's not for everyone. But for example, in my world, there is no state restoration by default. The default is that there is no state restoration, no serialization required at all. And that's, that's because it's simpler. And then if you want it, of course, you can go ahead and implement it. But by default, nope. The screen stays in memory, right? And that also means that if the process is killed, you start over. And honestly, it's actually sometimes better. If you think about a user using a small app, and you want them to, um, do you want, really want them to always start at the screen that they left? If it's been days and they haven't opened the app, I think it makes sense that if the app was killed, they start on the home screen. But again, if you really do want to keep the state, you just have to do it manually. By default, it makes things much simpler. And it's especially good for new developers. And third, simple. No injection, no complex notions, no other framework. Pure, plain, old Java and, and Android. OK, so architecture. The single uh, activity architecture is very simple. You keep one activity. You only have one. 
Instead, you have a view per screen, right? So you have your screen A. It has a view. It's drawn in the activity. And then when you want to go to a different screen, you just swap the view. We have this amazing system of views. Why not simply using? So that's what we're going to do. It's extrem extremely easy and simple. So screens and view. We have screens. And uh, the screens implement the logic. We have views, and they only, only implement the display, right? No logic in it, no business logic, no nothing. So now you might think, oh yeah, this is uh, something I've heard that I should use a design pattern. Uh, I've heard the MVC is a good one. Uh, oh wait, I also heard about the MVVM or something like that. Uh, but there's also this thing called the MVP, and everybody's talking about it, so I should probably use that instead. <sighs> really? No. If you look at the model view controller, what is it? It's three entities, the model, the controller, and the view, to separate your code. And the model talks to the controller, the controller talks to the view, the view talks to the controller, the controller talks to the model, the model talks to the view. I don't know. They all talk to each other. That makes no sense. <laughs> Seriously. Now you have the model view presenter. I actually like a little bit this one, but let me, let me modify it a little bit for you. What is the model view presenter? You have your model on one side. You have your view on the other side. And you have your presenter to implement the logic in, the, in between. OK. Well, first of all, why do all those things are always displayed in triangles? I don't get it. Let's just straighten that up a little bit, right? This is clearer. Second, um, let me make them bigger. And suddenly you realize we're back to something we all know. It's a good old design pattern, if you wish simply, normally architecting your codes in, yet in layers, right? We all know that. There is the Aussie model. There is like almost any application, any software, any piece of software use that model. And what it means is that each layer only talks to the one above it and below it. It's, you know, the very old, uh, the very old way, but that works. And while we're at it, let's rename it the model data, because why naming that model, I, I never understood. In the middle, I put my screen. That's the way I'm going to call my presenter is a screen. And that's where the logic lives. And the view is a, is a regular Android view that you already know. And that's how you do software development the old way. <laughs> All right. So why separate the logic from the views? Um, well, if you separate the, the logic from the views, then you're going to have a lot of benefits. So the logic lives in the screens, right? I explained that. What that means is that views are dumb. I repeat, my views are dumb. Do not put logic in your views, right? That completely defeats the purpose. And it's simple, again, good old uh, single responsibility principle. Second, screens are regular Java objects. If they're regular Java objects, there's nothing special about it, which means they're easy to test. You can just instantiate one and call the method on it, which means your logic is easy to test, because again, we separated the two, views are DOM, so my logic lives in my screen, so my logic is easy to test, which is what I want. And if you're going very fast and you don't have time to test all of your code, if there is one thing that you should focus on is to test your business logic. Right? It makes no sense to retest that the Android, Android frameworks displays views like it works. <laughs> so that also means, by the way, that screens are injection friendly. But like I said, it's just, it's just a nice side effect. Uh, I'm actually, I don't need that uh, to work that way. I happen to use a dependency injection framework when I, when I work, but you don't need it. OK, so that was the screens and the views. So the screens are separated from the views. OK, but how do you move between screens? All right. I had a few goals with my navigation system. First, I wanted full control of the back stack. Like I said, it makes no sense that you don't have control of your own app's back stack. Second, I wanted the animation to be handled automatically for me. Makes sense. Third. I wanted, of course, a connection to the activity lifecycle, because no matter what, you cannot get away with the, the activity lifecycle completely. Right? Uh, this is the way you talk to the Android framework and to the system. So you, you have to have some form of connection to it, even if you abstract it away as much as possible. 
And four, I wanted my navigation to be as simple as calling go to my screen. <coughs> How hard can that be? Why do I have to create a new intent, a new song? I, no, I just want to call a simple method to go to the next screen. So that's why I developed uh, a simple library called Magellan. And when I started, there was no real uh, alternatives. Uh, there was Mortar and Flow, uh, but it was very complex and hard to use, uh, even according to the, the developers. Um, and nowadays, there is a, there's a bunch of others. And again, that, that demonstrates that we're converging towards a solution, and I think we're, we're going in, in the right direction. And so mine is called Magellan, but uh, this is more about the architecture and the ID. You can use Magellan. It's open source. You can use another one. You can roll your own. It's not that hard. It's not that much code. The, the ID is what matters. So screens survive rotation, but not views. How does it work? You have a navigator. The navigator has a stack, a stack of screen. It's connected to your single activity. Let's call it main activity, but you can call it whatever you want. And the navigator look at the screen that's on the stack, ask M for view, and display that view. Right? So screen A has a view for screen A. Right? Now, if you rotate, what happens? Well, if you rotate, of course, a new activity is created. Uh, I didn't play tricks with the flags or something like that, no. Uh, good, old main, uh, good old activity, the normal, the normal way. So it's, it's rotated, which means the views are going to be recreated. That's what, you, that's what we want. But look, at the top, nothing changes. Because there's just this rotation, apart from redrawing the view, should not be uh, more complicated than that for your developer. So. With that in mind, navigating, all it means is pushing to the stack. So very simple. Again, you have the stack in the navigator. I push a new screen on it. And my navigator swaps the view for me. That's it. Very simple. Mm -hmm. And of course, navigating back simply means popping from the stack, like that. Easy. And by the way, we're really using this in production. This is not hypothetical. Uh, we've been using it for more than a year, and that's what it looks like on you know, our app when we're transitioning from one screen to another. This is handled automatically. So like I mentioned, my navigation is simply calling navigator.go to my screen. What this means is, because again, screens are simple objects, all I need to do is call new, like Java, and pass some data. That's it. That's all I need to do. Right? It's much simpler. And that allows us to develop really, really quickly. So we have a bunch of default uh, navigation. Uh, the go-to is the one you expect that slides from one side to another. Show uh, allows you to display things from the bottom. And that's just the default one. But of course, why not? We can override transitions. And that allows you to do stuff like this, circular reveal, or any sort of material animation you might want. And there is uh, the, the circular reveal one is, uh, is implemented for you, but uh, you can implement your own and do whatever you want. So to create a navigator, we have a nice little uh, Fluent API. You have to give it a screen to start with. Of course, it cannot uh, know what to display if you don't give it a screen. So that's enforced by the API, so you cannot get it wrong. And you have a bunch of little options, for example, enabling logging. Um, so having this full control allows us to do very interesting stuff. For example, automatically registering the events of the navigation and attaching, attaching that to uh, your crash, for example. And obviously, you can navigate to a screen and you can go back. But because we're implementing our own, you can go back to a specific screen. So we have this nice little method that says go back to a specific screen. Again, it's your app. You should have the full control. You can replace a screen very easily again. But I said full control of the backtrack, right? You can also decide to rewrite history. 
You can also decide that, oh, actually, it makes more sense in that situation to modify the back stack because there was a temporary screen, because you know, this screen no longer applies. It was just a success screen, for example, that needs to go away. Whatever is your reason, or maybe because you know, when, the other, uh, when the user is uh, logged out, you want to, of course, clear the stack and present the login screen, which is what I'm doing here in this example. Full control, complete control of your back stack. And finally, go back to uh, the beginning, screen of a simple life cycle, as promised. They're created, but notice that they're created with a constructor in Java, right? It's the normal constructor of Java, nothing fancy. The view is created, then it's shown, and it can be hidden. And then it's destroyed, again, like it's garbage collected, like a normal Java object. That's it. That's all we need. And by the way, you, you can access the life cycle of the activity if you really, truly want to, because sometimes you really need to, because you have to do something related to Android. But you don't have to touch the activity life cycle. How do, we oh, do I implement my screen? I only need to extend screen, and I only have one method. That's it, to create the view. Right? Remember, on my stack, my navigator asks my screen, please give me a view. I need to display yourself now. And so that's it. You have one method, create view. Then, of course, you have optional methods. For example, when the screen is shown, you usually want to display stuff, right? Uh, so you have an unshow method, and you can display stuff. And you have a few utilities just because, uh, because we can, because it's nice, like uh, setting the title that automatically sets the title uh, on, your, um, on your toolbar and stuff like that. But th those are optional. It's only if you really want them. How do you set that up? Well, uh, that's actually quite an, inter an interesting problem because you actually, um, you actually need um, to communicate with the activity, right? So there is a few libraries that decided to go with an interesting approach that I might actually explore in the future, which is a headless fragment. Believe it or not, the fragment is connected to the whole activity lifecycle, and so actually is a pretty good way, without using it uh, the normal way at all, completely, uh, completely using it as a, basically a listener of your activity, um, <laughs> You can use a headless fragment and implement something like that. Uh, you can look, I think Conductor is, uh, is using this approach. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, you might say, well, there is lifecycle callbacks nowadays. But turns out, you don't have all the callbacks you want. You're going to miss some, so you're going to have to talk uh, to your activity no matter what. So that doesn't really work. Uh, so what I decided to do is, <laughs> Someone is talking to me. Uh, what I decided to do is to um, simply um, have provide a, ba a base activity that I call single activity that does all that wiring for you. So it's calling all the lifecycle method on the navigator for you. So you just have to extend it. Um, but if you want, you can do it manually as well. The code is not, it's not that long. But that, that, comes, um, that comes with a big advantage, which is a pretty easy setup. Um, you're creating your navigator, like I mentioned before. Give it a first view, in this case, the home screen. And at the bottom, it's just the regular on create that you know, right? Uh, set content view, normal way. There's one more thing. In the activity XML file, you need to put a screen container. So my framework needs to know about uh, one view somewhere to, in order to swap views in it. And so I have a simple screen container. Uh, the reason why it's my own class and not simply an ID is because I also take care of disabling the touch events when you're navigating, so that you don't double tap and I end up with two screens. Uh, we used to not have that, and it was happening quite a lot. So it's pretty nice that uh, it handles that all out of the box. And if you've followed so far, you only need to know about two classes, screens and the navigator. That's it. There's others, you can override transitions, you can do a bunch of stuff, and I hope to implement even more uh, things in the future, but, but that's all you need to know. So it's certainly much simpler than the fragment system or any other library out there, actually. Uh, the one we have is the simplest one. You don't have complex notions to learn. 
And of course, it's open source, like I mentioned, uh, so you can already look at it. And even if you don't use it, I'm not there to sell you another framework or another thing. Uh, it's very interesting to look at the code and look at how it's done, right? Either because you might be just interested or because you want to reproduce it yourself or whatever that might be. The, the, it's an interesting exercise, if anything, and it's, it's a great architecture to know about, at least. Um, so you can look at it. We have a simple app, and we are working on a second one that's more advanced. And what's great is I'm announcing now that we're finally in 1.0, and so it's considered stable. Uh, Again, I've been using that in production for a year and a half, so it's pretty damn stable, but, uh, you know, there's always bugs. Um, so, that's not it. I don't know if oh, I'm doing on time, but um, there is a bunch of other stuff. Once you have the full control, once you have the system in place, once you're doing the basic stuff, you can have fun. So for example, for example, we have a nice little control of the toolbar. So here, when I change screen, my toolbar is changing to purple. And the elevation is, is uh, also changing. Well, I have a navigation listener. And so I have a navigation event. And when that happens, I pass the action bar configuration, and I automatically handle that for you. Nothing to do. And like I said, there's a lot, a lot more that we can do uh, with that system. Another thing that we decided to implement is uh, a RX uh, sort of plugin. So we have a few add-on uh, on uh, Magellan, and we hope to add more. Uh, the very first one that we needed because we're using RX uh, is a simple way to auto unsubscribe. So you have a RX screen, and when we use that, automatically your uh, observable is going to be unsubscribed at the right moment. That's pretty nice, but you can invent like more complex solution if you want. Uh, but this one is, uh, um, is part of the project, so you can get that for free. And in the future, uh, we are hoping to do even more. So for example, internally in our internal code base, we have a way to use uh, Magellan to do tabs. So each tab is its own screen. And what's really nice about it is that the screen don't know anything about being in a tab. So when your designer comes and be like, ah, oh, actually, this screen, I want to put it in this tab or whatever, you just take it and plug it somewhere else. That's pretty nice. It's not open source yet, but uh, coming soon, hopefully. Um, there is this constant problem, uh, with, especially on rotation, but in general, with asynchronism, that your view can be null, uh, whether because you are coming back from a thread, from background thread, or because you're rotating your screen, whatever is the reason, uh, your view might be null. So if you're, using, if you're using the Rx screen that I mentioned just before, it usually doesn't happen because I'm, I'm, I'm subscribe at the right moment. But there's always a situation where you cannot do that, um, and you really, truly need to complete. Uh, and in that case, uh, I'm going to implement a nice little pattern that uh, is basically a functional way of dealing with that problem. You simply pass a function of what you want to do on your view, and this is guaranteed to be only called when the view is not null. And you can, I'm not, not sure if I'm going to go that far, but you could even like replay that once the view is reattached. Right? It's, it's pretty nice. And that's all I have for now. Any questions? And if you don't have questions, I have uh, more stuff to talk about. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> how, much, how much time do I have left? Thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, it seems really inspired from uh, iOS navigation system. Uh, I wanted to ask, how do you replace uh, the equivalent of uh, start activity for result, which is uh, a pattern that we found on iOS with uh, the delegate? How do you do it if the, you have the, one single activity? The member of my team asked you to ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, have, uh, I have this on my to-do list. It's, uh, it's a very good point. Um, so right now, you would have to do that a little bit manually, but I'm working on it. Um, so pretty, pretty simple, right? Like All you need to do is to have, some again, some functions, some callback um, that 
you know, gives you the result that you're looking for. Uh, and also, you, of course, uh, need to plug that also to the activity, uh, start activity for result. So the answer is, it's coming. Uh, I'm working on it. To answer your question, you have uh, 15 minutes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, one of the things I was wondering is that, okay, activities have drawbacks for sure, but it was also interesting recently when they introduced Link Canary, because you could see that you're leaking, something mm -hmm. is wrong, mm -hmm. you're trying to use the UI when it's died. Uh, so is it possible to leak views? How can it help to make an application that doesn't leak over time, stuff like that? So of course it's possible, uh, and uh, I don't think there is a single way that you can completely prevent that from happening. Uh, you need to detect it, so with stuff like the canary. But if someone puts a context in a static field, you're done. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to prevent that. Um, but it does encourage you to not do that by separating cleanly your logic from your views, right? So in, in my model, because my screens don't go away, and again, it's, it's an opinion, it's very opinionated, right? Uh, because my screens uh, do not go away even when you navigate to a new screen, right? As long as they're in the stack, they don't go away you cannot store heavy object or context or anything like that in it. Uh, the plan that I have to solve that problem is to actually implement, so leak canary, I don't know if you know that, but it's extensible. So you can implement a leak detector that's dedicated to uh, Magellan. Uh, that would do exactly the same thing that uh, leak canary does for activity, but for screens. So that's on my to-do list as well, but it's a very good point. Hello, thanks for the presentation. Um, how will you manage the runtime permissions? Same thing. Uh, you have, uh, so it's the same as the uh, activity result, right? You have uh, the callbacks that you have on your activities. That's why you cannot um, do completely without your activity. You have to be somehow plugged into your activity. Um, so you get this callback this just the same way you get on the activity, and I'm going to propagate Again, I'm not sure if it's in, it made it in the one, one or, or not, but it, it's going to be propagated to your screen, and on your screen, you're going to have the same callback as you have on your activity. But the, the point is that you don't need those unless you are doing something uh, and very Android-specific. Um, so in, in general, you absolutely don't need uh, those callbacks, but you, you have them available. Okay, thank you. How do you manage uh, dialogue? Ah, good point. Great, great questions. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm really happy, actually. Uh, so yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, that is something I didn't mention, and I'll add it to my slides the next time. Um, actually, I handle that. It's completely handled for you. And the way I do that is I have a show dialogue method. It's a little bit subtle. I have a show dialogue method that takes a dialogue constructor, if you wish. Um, Dialog creator, I think, is called in the code base. And the reason is because you cannot keep your dialogue because this, the view is going to be destroyed, right? When you rotate the screen, for example, the view is going to be destroyed. And so you need to re the ability to recreate automatically this dialogue if you want that to be very painless for the developers. So that's exactly what I'm doing. I ask for a dialogue creator. When you show that dialogue, you pass this creator. Right? It's a simple method that creates a dialogue. And when you rotate, I automatically recall that method to re-display the dialogue. And because if you have any data or whatever, if, because the screen is not destroyed, you can access your data and re-display whatever you were uh, displaying. And it's, it, it, makes, it makes the code with dialogue actually extremely, extremely nice, because there is already the nice builders uh, of the framework, and you can just, it's compatible, you can just use them uh, the, way, uh, the way you would normally, but you get the recreation of them for free, so it's, it's pretty cool, actually. And following up on dialogues, uh, what I, if I want to have a dialogue fragment, uh, let's say I use a bottom sheet dialogue fragment, uh, because I don't know about uh, just dialogue counterpart. Yeah, so with this model, and it's not just limited to dialogues, actually. Uh, bottom sheet is a good example. We're working on it uh, at the moment. Um, 
you can't use fragments. You, you just cannot. Uh, because I don't, I don't even, or at least that's not how it was uh, designed, right? So you always need to be able to have the view equivalent. Uh, and if you have, like, a very, very interesting example that's a little bit more complicated than a dialog or bottom machine dialog is uh, what if you have, for example, a map, right? A Google map or something like that. And you already have in the SDK a fragment that is, you know, managing everything for you. Uh, well, that means you can't use that. So it's, it's, it's a drawback, but every single framework or, or SDK or whatever, Google or not, that I looked at, there is always the view option. So there's always a way that you can create a screen in my system that's equivalent to the fragments. So it's, it's, it's always possible to get around that. And in practice, it's never been an issue. We, we f the first instinct, of course, is like, okay, let me just use that fragment because it's what's given to me. But then if you, if you look at that fragment, this fragment is displaying a view, and so you can use that view directly. Also, hopefully, I, I, I plan on adding more and more of those components so that out of the box, you can have a bunch of those uh, for free. Hi. So Hi. one other thing that's very tied into life cycles is data loading, and in particular the loader framework. So I'm curious your comments about using something like that with your framework. I've never looked at uh, the loader framework, uh, framework actually, but uh, I don't see why not. I don't see why you could not use the, the loader framework. Uh, do you know, is it, is it very tied to the fragments or to the activity itself? I actually don't know about it. Yeah, so Android's loader framework, uh, loaders are aware of the activity life cycle. So if your activity is stopped, the loader gets destroyed automatically. So in this case, nope. That's not really a good option. Because that's the point of those uh, loader to be tied to the activity life cycle. So you would have to rewrite something like I mentioned. So for Rx, I have that, that Rx screen that automatically does something for you. Uh, so you'd have to rewrite that. Um, but honestly, um, nowadays, uh, I, I really would go <laughs> with Rx and not with that loaders. But that's just me. Hi. I Hi. had another question about um, when you set your app to background uh, on Android system, uh, sometimes the, the JVM is killed. How do you manage restoration? It's terrible, right? How, how are we going to survive without state restoration? Oh my god, what am I going to do? It's never been a problem in practice. We've, been, we've been using that system for a year and a half. Okay, your app is killed. You start over. That's fine. It's completely fine. Uh, maybe not for your specific use case, but again, usually you, you, there's something you want to do, right? You want to restore some state that the user were okay. in. Okay, uh, let's say I'm on a transaction. I'm going to pay something, mm -hmm. and I get an SMS mm -hmm. to be read mm -hmm. in order to, to pay my transaction. Mm -hmm. And if my app starts mm -hmm. uh, on this moment, and I lose my state, I'm going to be quite annoyed. If you have something like that, where it's extremely important, then yes, by all means, implement some form of state restoration, actually, ideally, uh, implement something that saves it on your server, right? And when you restart your app, reload that state from the server, even. Uh, but you can also just do that locally. That's perfectly fine. And by the way, uh, my system completely allows you to do that. You, even have, you can even use, if you really want to, the um, unsave instant state, the one that you use uh, uh, in an activity. But the point is, you don't have to. By default, there is no need to think about that. By default, it's simple. And then if, if you absolutely have that need, then by all means, just write some code for it. Um, but, but that should not be the default, at least not in my opinion. Especially when you're working on like a small little app um, that have a bunch of screens, but is fundamentally very simple, like, I don't know, a news app or something. Usually, you don't need any of that. Um, again, it's not for everybody. I, I completely understand that. Other question. Go ahead. Um, I, I know that uh, Android views have built-in uh, state uh, saving. Uh, let's say edit text uh, saves uh, what the user in, uh, in, uh, put in. And uh, I'm wondering uh, when, uh, I, if I'm using your library, uh, will it, uh, and uh, I, I use views with uh, an edit text, will it be saved? Great question. I, those were not prepared. <laughs> 
It's a great question. Turns out it works out of the box. Turns out uh, I am actually saving the view state and restoring it. So you get the full mechanism of view state restoration uh, that Android provides for free. So that means that if uh, I uh, implement a custom view for uh, my screen and uh, I use on state and uh, on restore instant state, all my states get back. It's going to work. Okay. It's going to work out of the box. But by the way, when we implement custom views, and we implement custom views a lot, right, because we have one per screen, uh, and we have more, of course, because we have reusable views, reusable components, and stuff like that, turns out we actually never do that. Right? Because we have this screen that survives rotation. So whatever thing we need to remember, we just remember it as a variable, a simple member variable of your screen. And it makes your code so much easier when you don't have to deal with serialization and stuff like that. But if you want to, you can, and it's going to work. And for the most importantly, the one that I already implemented, uh, you get those for free. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about it because on some low-end phones or some uh, phones that have a lot of foreground services, for example, and uh, pro processes get killed really, really fast. And you know, you you, you switch to two apps, totally. and then it's totally. killed. So uh, again, for some apps, that, that doesn't matter. Maybe uh, I'm. No, no, no. no you're, this is a very good point. Okay. Again, this is very opinionated. I think the 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 s the only way to make something that simple. Right? Making something simple is, is not as easy right, as it sounds. And the only way is to make strong decisions, to have strong opinions about uh, what you're doing. This is the only way to simplify. Right? Uh, your iPhone doesn't ask you where to save. Your Android phone doesn't uh, ask you where to save a file either. Uh, this is the new way of uh, dealing with uh, simplicity. You just make those decisions for the user. And in this case, I made a bunch of decisions. Your iPhone also doesn't let you change your home screen. If you want to do that, use Android instead, right? Um, well, it's the same way. If you want more complicated stuff, and I totally understand, either use Fragments, use Conductor, one of the other alternatives. But if you just want something simple that works, and you're not too concerned about getting killed in the background, and if you're getting killed in the back background, you're OK starting over, or you're ready to write a little bit of code to restore your state, then it's a much, much simpler option. It's the, so one important thing to know is that the productivity we got with this system was just incredible. We were following a team of iOS developers shipping features at the same pace with half the team. They were double in size than us, and we were managing to keep pace in terms of feature development, in terms of new screens added to the app, thanks in, in big part thanks to this framework. And there's a bunch of other things that we do to simplify our lives, but this is a big part of it. And my team, actually, they would not go back. They're, they were bugging me to open source. Now it's finally open source. Uh, they told me, I, I, I don't want to use anything else anymore. Um, so you can use another framework, but uh, it's 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 really really incredible the productivity you gain with something like that. Last one. Last one. Okay. Hi. Uh, it's a short question, but uh, I just wanted to know how you deal with tests because it's important, mm -hmm. even if you test at a logic level and a model level, we still need UI tests. That's right. And um, today, as I use it, uh, tests are very tightly... That's right. ...are very close to activities when you set your activities in a row for yep. Espresso. Yep. And then how do you arrive in your test to a specific state of your screen and uh, don't have to go right. through all the paths to, to right. be in the right state. Right. So Thank it you. actually makes, this is one of the big reasons why I did that, that, that li library. This is actually much, much simpler when you have something like that rather than have the, the normal system. So for unit tests, that means that most of your app doesn't require RoboElectric or anything like that. You just have plain old Java objects. There is some objects from the Android framework that are passed here and there, but you can just you know, mock them or set them to null, and you know, the, the screen is not going to care, because the screen is almost purely a Java object. But that, that handles that, right? It extremely makes it way, way uh, more manageable. 
uh, for views, you're right, uh, we actually, I said that you should focus on your logic, but I, we actually test everything. We're a financial app, so <laughs> everything is very, very, very well tested. Um, so the views are all tested as well. Because they're dumb, remember, uh, my views are dumb. Because they're dumb, all they do is take some text, let's say, and display it, and that's it, right? Some image and display it, that's it. So because they're so simple, they're, that makes it easier to test as well. Uh, as a side effect, and we're using uh, uh, RoboElectric for this, uh, but um, honestly, it, it, it's only a small part of your code at that point. And we also use uh, Espresso, and we also have uh, UI level test. And with things like that, it's extremely easy to go quickly to the screen you're interested in, or to set the state of your screen, because it's, again, pure Java object, and you have full control over it, so you can set some, sta some state, and set some, some flag or whatever you need to to put your app in the right state. So it's, everything is actually much simpler with that. Thank you. Thank you.